Shane Shane Sun. Uh, Shane has been Shane has been uh, uh, with Linky for several years, right? Um, he studied model UN uh, at Linky uh, for for several years, and uh, he's currently uh, coaching model UN at Linky uh, as a coach. And uh, Shane has won numerous. Uh, model UN championships uh, at different uh, conferences, uh, including the uh, Harvard Model UN Championship, uh, University, University of Pennsylvania, uh, McGill, and U of T. Uh, currently, Shane is pursuing his uh, bachelor degree at one of the best business schools uh, in the world. Uh, he's attending uh, Stern Business School at NYU. So if everyone knows the business school, uh, Stern is one of the best. All right, without further ado, let me turn the microphone, the podium to Shane. Shane, it's all yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, Henry. Appreciate that. And just picking off where Henry left off, good evening everyone my name is Shane Sun today I'm going to be one of your presenters for Linky Mali United Nations uh, first second semester 2022 information seminars about Mali UN just to get off get us started today I'll be covering six separate topics I would ask that you please hold any questions you have about something that I said when I finish one of these topics. And you'll know I finished one of these topics because there will be a slideshow with a number that tells you exactly what topic we're entering into. When we get to one of those slides, feel free to raise your hand on Zoom and I can address whatever questions you have about the topic I just covered. And at the end of this approximately 40 minute seminar, I have 20 minutes left um, to answer any questions you may have, and perhaps even longer, I've left my contact information as well. So let's get started first with introducing myself. My name is Shane. I'm currently a Molly UN coach at Linky. Formerly, I was Linky's uh, head delegate or team captain for our most competitive travel team that went all over the world, both virtually and person, went to Cornell, Princeton, Harvard, Stanford, MIT. Vancouver, um, McGill, Toronto, some of the places I've been for Model UN. And currently I'm studying finance and public policy at New York University. Henry, would you also like to quickly introduce yourself or do you want to leave this to the end? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a you know, director of Linky. I think everybody knows me, most of the people. Um, I uh, graduated from you know, Northwestern uh, Kellogg, <coughs> sorry, Northwestern Kellogg School of Management, uh, also considered a good business school, uh, although we're a competitor to Stern, uh, which Shane, Shane is currently attending. Uh, yeah, I work at, you know, different companies uh, for the past, I don't know, many, many years. Uh, I work at IBM, Canon, Deloitte, American Express, and uh, I started in Key uh, around six years ago, right? Uh, yeah, that's about me. Uh, and then we, uh, after uh, Shane finishes uh, his presentation, I'll be doing a quick recap in Mandarin Chinese, and then we'll, we'll take the Q&A. All right, okay. back to you, Shane. All right, sounds great. Let's get straight into it, everyone. So we're entering our first content section. Um, what is Model United Nations? Since I understand that many of the people here today are hearing about Mali UN for the first time, or they're still beginners to the concept, lots of parents here with us today. I'm gonna to try to explain Mali United Nations, which is the competitive activity we have curriculum classes here for at Linky. So once you understand this activity, then you can sort of understand better the value that Linky provides to you as part of your child's education. So Model United Nations is what its name sounds like. We are modeling the operations of the United Nations. And if you're familiar with the United Nations, you might know that they have quite a large role in our society. They have three principal functions. That one, 
to prevent a world war, two, end humanitarian crises in the world like hunger um, or uh, small arms, like small weapons that are causing damage to humans, and three, accelerate the scientific and cultural progress of humankind. And that also includes preserving our culture, our history. So the UN sounds like this very large body that has a lot of very large overarching goals. And how exactly, as a student, you are going to be modeling these operations and debates, I decided to split up into this, or I think relatively to understand this six step process. So while your overarching goal is to, for example, one, prevent a world war, to end the crisis and three, accelerate humankind. The specific ways that you do it, uh, we follow some rules, just like how a debate, while the goal of your debate is to win for your side, you still need to debate according to certain rules and procedures. And here they are in Model UN. So I've split these into basics. The first basic you need to know when you are participating in Model UN is that you don't represent yourself as an individual. You don't go into the United Nations and declare I, as the sovereign citizen of Shane Sun, believes um, X, Y, Z should be done. Instead, I would declare that I, Shane Sun, as a ambassador to a sovereign nation in the world, or a country of a sovereign nation in the world, wants X, Y, Z solution to be done to a problem. And the reason we do this is because the United Nations is founded on the principle of one country, one vote. It was created after World War II to ensure that there would be no more world wars in the, uh, in the world, essentially. And world wars were caused by nations, countries, sovereign countries, having disagreements with each other. And the UN wanted to equalize the power of these countries. If every country could only have one vote, larger countries would be less inclined to bully smaller countries or even, God forbid, invade a smaller country. So uh, for these nations to not go to war, you will be representing the interest of a nation. And people like this exist in real life. They are called ambassadors or diplomats. In Model UN, you take on the character of an ambassador or a diplomat. The second important tenant about Model UN is that the debate is real, uh, sometimes even deadly real. We are talking about nuclear weapons sometimes, oil prices, Currently, Russia is threatening to invade Ukraine. All of these are valid topics that the UN should and can be, uh, can be discussing. So this means that uh, uh, compared to other forms of communication, competitions like public speaking or debate, Model UN requires you to have a pr pretty thorough understanding of what's going on and also an understanding of what your ideas and actions um, can lead to for consequences. That's something I'll get into later. But just remember that you're an ambassador representing real countries, talking about real life issues that are happening across the world. And finally, Model UN is much more collaborative than it is competitive. I mentioned earlier that the United Nations wants countries to agree with each other, to not go to war, to not fight over resources like what happened in World War II. So um, delegates, which are the students in Model UN, are encouraged to form alliances and teams in order to push ahead with their beliefs. Instead of individually declaring that they believe their beliefs are the best, in Model UN, it's oftentimes advantageous to ally with others of similar beliefs as you and form a united front. Exactly how that happens, I will be discussing very soon. Let me admit, okay. And usually when I describe Model UN in this way, with these three basics, the default reaction I get is, uh, this is absolutely terrifying, or this is a ton of pressure. Because being a leader is a ton of pressure. Debating about real life issues that could potentially kill real people, that's a lot of pressure. Being an ambassador for an entire country, like the Canada nation, 37 million people, representing the views of 37 million people is also a lot of pressure. Um, I would say, hold on to that thought. And at the end of this uh, seminar, I want, you, I want us to revisit that thought together. Is Model UN really that terrifying and a lot of pressure? So how we go uh, about you know, solving the world's issues essentially in Model UN is through a six-step process. 
process uh, step one, as I mentioned, is that a real issue needs to be presented to students. And right now, if you've heard on the news, Russia looks like it's about to invade Ukraine. This is an actual thing that's happening. Russia has 100,000 troops near the Donbass region in Ukraine. Russia's already annexed Crimea. He's uh, Russia's taken two regions of Ukraine already. Russian separatists are in that region. Um, the British are airlifting supplies into the region. It literally looks like a border war is about to break out. So this would be the issue that's presented for debating to students. And once this issue is presented, the students are no longer just themselves. They're no longer even called students. They're actually called delegates now. And 30 to 40 of these delegates, and like I said, these delegates are ambassadors of their countries. They're delegates of their countries. The word delegate and ambassador mean the same thing in this context. They are assembled into a group, and we're going to call that group a committee. So a committee of 30 to 40 ambassadors. They now come together and they need to research. They need to understand exactly what is going on. So I mentioned earlier that the British are airlifting supplies into the region. Perhaps you would look at what the BBC is saying. Uh, I mentioned that uh, Russia has annexed Crimea. It's a region that historically belonged to Russia, but then what other claims does Ukraine have towards the region? Perhaps you might need to research that. Afterwards, delegates might also be required to research, importantly, what their own country thinks. If you are the delegate of the United Kingdom, you might have one opinion. And if you're the delegate of Canada, you might have one opinion. More, um, a more stark contrast would be if you were the delegate of Russia, you will have a very different opinion on what to do with the situation than if you were the delegate of the United States or if you were the delegate of China. All these big, large countries will have differing views on how they want the world to be run. And in this particular instance, where Russia is being accused of invading another sovereign nation, of course, the Russian ambassador might not take too kindly about it, of these accusations. So the Russian ambassador doesn't take too kindly of these accusations, and we enter into step four, which now lively debate. All these different countries with their different beliefs on how this problem should be solved, if solved at all, will defend and declare their beliefs. After it's clear what each country believes in, and countries do this through usually one to two minute public speeches. They start forming teams. This is where the cooperation part of Model UN comes in. No country is going to be able to push through their own beliefs and enforce it on everyone else because the United Nations operates like a democracy. Every country only has one vote on what should be done. So as much as the Russian Federation might want other countries to ignore this issue, you'll have to find other countries who agree with them and vote with them. And then this problem is officially attempted to be solved through a UN resolution. And this is delegates coming together to write a UN law. I'm just gonna leave this on the screen for a second while I take a drink. All right, so that's a very rough committee timeline of what goes on in Model UN. And all of this is being done, like I said earlier, to reach this overall goal of preventing world war, ending humanitarian crises, and accelerating the economy. All right, so that is a very brief, <clears throat> brief introduction to Model UN. Are there any questions at this time about what I just covered about the operations and debates of Model UN? Um, Shane, I think you can proceed and then we'll leave all the questions at the end. All right, that sounds good. So Model UN at Linky is split into four curricular levels. One, two, three, and four. That's quite easy to understand. And each of these levels has their own expectations <clears throat> for teachers and students on 
what the students will learn in the committee, as well as what types of competitive opportunities will be available to these students. So in Model UN Level 1, which is our introductory course, we will mostly be focusing on the theory of model United Nations. So this includes how to research what your country believes. We are absolutely certain that the delegate of Canada will have a different opinion with the delegate of Russia. But what are those exact opinions? What exactly does the Russian Federation think about the situation in Ukraine? Secondly, we will cover some of the rules, rules of procedure of Model UN. You might notice that Model UN uh, functions very similarly to a parliament where people propose laws, they debate them, and then they pass those laws. Well, parliaments operate on a plethora of rules, and so does Model UN. So we'll be working through that. We'll also be teaching students how to speak properly in Model UN. In level two, we learned more how to become a leader in your committee. So not just be a participant and speak, but also how to propose laws and get people to support you to become a leader in negotiations. We'll be covering a little bit of foreign affairs and international relations theories, um, things like, for example, offensive realism or constructivism, these academic concepts uh, that under, uh, underpin pretty much all of international relations and diplomacy, and well as writing resolutions. Resolutions are a form of UN law, UN legislation. And if you've ever read a law, you will notice the language you can use in those laws is very specific. So we'll also be learning how to write according to that specific language requirement. Level three, at this time, uh, delegates are usually prepared to go to their first large uh, competition. And potentially the competition will be outside of Canada. So I'm just calling any competition where we feel the team that's outside of Canada as a travel team, since you have to travel outside of Canada. During this time, we'd be teaching them again solutions, ideation, which is finding those solutions for your resolution papers, advanced researching, how to make sure you have more information than everyone else so you can propose the best solutions and win the most debate. And finally, level four is where we have a full competitive focus for Model UN. Usually, level four students form the bulk of our travel teams. Um, level four students uh, are I think very, very inclined to win as many awards as possible at the most you know, brand name universities. Uh, that's why we offer usually two international competition opportunities for academics this semester, mostly geared towards level three and level four teams. Throughout the semester that you take a Molly one class at Link Key, other than learning uh, the curriculum, things like rules of procedure and speech craft, at least for my level one class, I can say for certainty that we have weekly lectures and analysis on current events. By current events, I mean um, an example I just brought up earlier, which is Russia is about to invade Ukraine. That would be something that we would discuss in essentially all of our classes. Um, the, the level two class discussed the Afghanistan war, specifically the United States withdrawing troops out of Afghanistan. And my class last week discussed Canadian Arctic sovereignty, which is another realm that we are butting heads with Russia. Here are some examples of lecture content that is presented in our classes. So these are actual linky slides. This is presented by my colleague Hunter McGuire, who is teaching level two. Uh, this was on this was from his Afghanistan conflict lecture that he shared with me. This slide is about how all four US presidents have essentially the same view of what's going on in Afghanistan. And of course, with the rest of the slide, he goes more in depth into this very complex situation. This is an example of a speech I wrote that I use as an example in my speechcraft unit uh, for my level one class. This is about Arctic Ocean sovereignty, perfect. And it's about Arctic, uh, Arctic oil drilling talking about the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is an example of a UN resolution, uh, talks about revamping the Arctic Council, which is another example of an international organization like the UN. Uh, I think this also covers an idea called an economic condominium, which is a legal categorization of a uh, piece of land or ocean. And this is another example of when we were learning rules of procedure early in the semester in my class. Uh, this is a helpful, 
helpful infographic that explains different ways that you can propose motions, which are ways to speak in Model UN. All right, so now that we've covered the basics of curriculum at Linky, as well as what Model UN is, let's get into the competitive side, which is, you know, why are we doing all of this? Um, how are we going to use this and then generate awards at Model United Nations conferences? By conference, I mean competition. In Model UN, we just call our competitions a conference. So never use the word conference, just think competition. And it's usually multi-day, so like three to four day competition. Three types of conferences or competitions in Model UN, ranging from regional to international. Regional, it's usually uh, regional conferences that Linky students go to would be local, hosted by high schools in the greater Toronto region. Um, examples would be ones hosted by UCC or UPS, private schools in Toronto. And these regional conferences usually attract around 300 to 400 students total. Then we have national level conferences hosted across Canada, usually in the major metro areas. So I'm talking about Toronto, Vancouver, and Montreal. There is one in Montreal hosted by McGill, one in Toronto hosted by the University of Toronto, and around two to three in Vancouver hosted just by private by organizations. And usually you have around 300 to 500, sometimes 600 students coming to these national conferences across Canada. And oftentimes you get many people from the Midwestern US and Eastern seaboard of the United States. Finally, you have these large international conferences. These are exclusively hosted pretty much by the Ivy League. Um, Mall UN is very popular in the US East Coast and the US East Coast academics is dominated by the Ivy League. Um, so we're talking about uh, the ones that Linky has been to, at least, we're talking about Harvard, Penn. Uh, I know, even though they're not Ivy Leagues, MIT, Stanford, uh, also Cornell. These are major international conferences, sometimes upwards of a thousand students. Regional conferences, we ask students to attend at their own discretion, or Linky goes like maybe one a year. These are mainly used for training. Uh, we're not really going to these for awards necessarily, uh, just so students can have a on time and practice some of the skills they've been learning in class. We mainly try to focus on winning awards at national and international conferences, which we go to two to three semesters, two to three times, or one to two times, respectively, per semester. So a uh, quick recap, last semester, oh, uh, I'll cover that in the next slide. So our teaching methodology, uh, it forms the core of our, uh, I guess, competitive coaching methodology. So everything starts in the classroom, and then we build our way up to the actual day of the competition. Our teaching methodology, I think, is buttressed by two ideas. One is having highly experienced instructors, and two, having hybrid style lessons. So our instructors all go to universities, major metro areas, very international-minded people, people from UFT, Sciences Po in France, Columbia in New York City, and NYU in New York City. And all of these instructors have strong individual competitive records. So I'm talking about they have one at the Ivy League, they have one at major international conferences in Europe, US, Canada, and um, Asia, Middle East. Or many of them, like my colleague Hunter, have secretariat experience, which means uh, they are actually the ones organizing this conference for others. They are the ones taking a leadership position and being um, the moderators of the debate. And in Model UN, you might have noticed that we don't split our class into a competitive or curriculum track. We just have one combined Model UN course. And that's because the coaches at their discretion will alternate the focus of the class between competition preparation and curriculum teaching. So we might have at the beginning of the year, one month of curriculum teaching. And when we go to Princeton and McGill in November, um, starting, for example, mid-October, we would then transition to a competition preparation focus series of weeks. And those weeks, we would be uh, advising students on how to write speeches, how to research their country. And let's say after Princeton and McGill is finished, when it's December, then we translate back to curriculum focus periods. And perhaps we talk about Canada's Arctic Ocean sovereignty or what's going on uh, with the economy of Argentina, for example. 
This just gives our coaches lots of flexibility and allows the students to learn theory, but then immediately apply it right after when we go to competition. Our coaching methodology, and by coaching, I mean uh, when we are actively preparing to go to a competition or during the competition, when we're advising students on how to maximize their chances of winning, uh, is then split into four key components. First one is uh, class time. So we give usually students around three to four weeks of dedicated class time to prepare for competition under the tutelage of an instructor. So all of our instructors are able to advise students on how to best prepare their speeches and all other material that needs to be prepared in advance of a conference. So in Model UN, a lot of preparation has to go in beforehand, since uh, you can imagine yourself as like a lawyer or a business person going into an important meeting or court case, you need to absolutely be prepared to have a speech ready to answer questions from others. You need to know the situation very in depth, have done your research, be well spoken, well read. A lot of work goes into this, contrary to, for example, uh, impromptu debate, which is more about uh, expressing yourself in the moment. Model UN, uh, much of your chances of winning, of doing well, is determined by how well you research, how well you prepare beforehand. So we make sure students have lots of time with teachers in uh, small classroom settings to do that. The next thing we offer is one-on-one -on -one time with teaching assistants. And teaching assistants are always uh, lengthy level four Model UN uh, travel team students that have already won at major conferences like McGill, Toronto, some have even won at Princeton. And we offer a one-on-one -on -one brainstorming and writing session. Those have been really helpful with students since they're talking to someone that's roughly similar age to them, that's also learning Model UN and is also competing, but that student is much more senior and has more relatable advice for them. Then when we actually get to conference and it's the three or four days that we are competing at, uh, Princeton or Harvard, for example, mm -hmm. um, we will have one of our competition instructors, which will be me or our head coach, Nerpan, or a hunter uh, leading strategy calls during breaks between conference uh, sessions. Usually Model UN conferences last around uh, four to eight hours a day, split into around one hour sessions. We might have an hour of day debate, then rest time, and then another hour, and then rest time. And usually this goes on for two to three, three to four days. Longest conference I think I've been to was around six, was around 20, 20 hours of debate time. And finally, we always have one on, well, one on one on one parent teacher student meetings afterwards where we discuss key takeaways. Um, you know, if why a student has won, why a student has not won, what the student did correctly with their preparation one month in advance. Uh, feedback from their teaching assistant. And uh, this, this form of coaching, I believe, definitely produces results. Our goal, bottom line, is to help students win awards at international model event competitions. And currently, in terms of total awards won in the last year, um, we are clearly, and by a pretty large margin, Ontario's top private model UN education institute um, per capita absolute any way you count it we have won the most awards across many prestigious conferences at harvard at princeton mit stanford the most awards in the last year last semester as well as this summer these were some of our results um at mcgill three students won best in committee as well as many students winning second and third place awards at harvard dubai we have one best one outstanding um, the, those words, best at standing honorable and diplomatic, uh, those are placeholders for first, second, third, and fourth. So one first, one second, two thirds, and one fourth. Uh, multiple people can win, you know, first, second, third in Model UN because you are sectioned into a, uh, into a group, into a committee of 40 to 60 to 70 people. So in each of those committees, there will be usually a first, second, and third place winner. So if there are, let's say, 60 people in the committee, um, only three people will win awards. So around the top 5% of students will come home with an award, award, a best, an outstanding, or an honorable. 
at Princeton, very notably, our entire team, so Linky as the team or delegation, won a second place team award, which was um, the result of the hard work of our level four students who went there. MIT, we won two best delegates, and those were first in committee. So I'm about near the halfway mark of my presentation. We're going to talk now about Model UN and its effect on university applications. So I went to high school in Canada. I currently go to university in the United States. So I'm familiar with both the Canadian uh, university application process, as well as the US elite college application process. I will be talking about both and how Model UN uh, is, uh, is, I think, a very, very effective uh, use of your time in preparing for admissions in both systems. So in Canada, the trend for the last three to four years, and especially during my year, which was affected a lot by COVID, was, um, was the idea that Canadian universities are asking for more and more from students if they want admission into top programs as well as top universities. Three ways that these universities are expanding their selection criteria. Uh, the first is the idea that grade inflation is real. It's definitely happening across Ontario. The, I guess the scientific reason for this is because Ontario does not have a standardized test. We don't have a college, no, sorry, a high school exit test like the SAT that they have in the United States or the Gaokao in China. It is up to teacher discretion and high school teachers are having lots of pressure to give good uh, grades to their students. And that's increasing competition for universities across the board. So universities have responded to this by uh, putting increased value on extracurriculars. And this is through something known as additional information forms that are required for students applying to software engineering at the University of Waterloo, engineering at the University of Waterloo, engineering at the University of Toronto, for Queen's Health Science, for Queen's Business, for Western, um, all these great programs and great schools are asking students to tell us what do you do in your free time and what extracurriculars are you engaged in? So almost all top engineering business pre-med programs require extracurriculars. Um, don't be fooled by the admissions rates for some of these Canadian schools, for example, U of T or McGill, uh, that's for the admissions rate of the entire school. If you're applying to their specific business program or engineering program, a lot more will be expected of you and the acceptance rate starts dropping significantly. So students have now responded or they have been responding by winning awards that they hope can help them stand out. So awards count as extracurricular. In fact, they count as excellence in extracurriculars. Um, but when we talk about awards, especially when I was in high school, and I didn't really know much about the university application process. My first thought when it came to awards were uh, DECA debate and math. That is what a lot of parents expect their students to excel in. And a lot of parents want their students to get these awards for the specific reasons I mentioned earlier, because of grade inflation and the requirement of extracurriculars. However, to win at an international level at math, DECA, and debate, is actually quite hard because this is a very saturated field within the GTA. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but uh, Ontario's DECA organization, so DECA Ontario, um, the year that I went to internationals with DECA Ontario, I found that DECA Ontario is the strongest DECA chapter or DECA organization in the world. Uh, there's so much competition for DECA in Ontario that we are better than DECA California, better than Texas, better than Massachusetts, better than Florida. We win like double the awards of the second place chapter. And it's not because people in Ontario are just smarter than people in California. It's because people in California have more options for their high school students to involve themselves extracurricularly. DECA is seen as a very default option for a lot of students interested in business. And instead of doing something like Model UN, for example, Oh, we have everyone in our DECA chapters, which does make it very strong, but also makes distinguishing yourself very hard. 
So keep these in mind um, here at Linky in our Molly One program. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our goal is for your student to win internationally and to win many awards, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, MIT, at, at these top conferences hosted by these top universities. All right, so now a bit into the US application process. So fair warning, um, this is not like a scientific formula or anything. The US application process is much more uh, complicated than the Canadian process it requires a lot more inputs and there's a lot more variables that determine what happens and a lot more random chance as well. But Model UN is already a very popular option in the United States. It's also a very safe option for students from Canada looking to dis distinguish themselves to admissions offices. And here is why. Around 40% of your chance of admission to a top liberal arts private school on the US East Coast will be determined by academics. Um, of course, a large focus remains on academic involvement, but this is much lower than in Canada. In Canada, about 70 to 80%, 70 to 100%, I would say, of your admissions chance uh, remains on your academic involvement. However, in the US, they also have a 30% consideration for awards and extracurriculars. And this is actually shown by how the common university application, which is used to apply to US schools like Harvard, Yale, or MIT, is, um, is formatted because they have five slots for awards and then 10 slots for extracurriculars. So you can be involved in up to 10 extracurriculars and win five major awards in high school and you would be able to list all of them. And then 30% of your chance of admission to a top US private school is determined, <clears throat> sorry, is determined by your ability to write essays and what experiences you've had. So writing ability determines your ability to write essays, but uh, colleges want to hear how you've overcome hardship and what lived experiences you've had. And Model UN is, in my opinion, the most eye-opening activity I did in high school. I got to travel um, across Canada and the US. In grade 10, for example, I went to Toronto, and took a train to Van train to Montreal, and went on a flight with my coach to Vancouver. Um, and those were definitely eye-opening experiences that I could have written about in my essays. Uh, those essays also require me to have strong writing ability, which Molly Wen rigorously helped me to build. And overcoming hardship is definitely something that I think all universities value. And Molly Wen, just not necessarily at Linky, but just as a uh, as an extracurricular pursuit, is great for teaching students about overcoming hardship because you can spend a month preparing for a conference and spend four days competing, eight hours, eight hours a day eight hours a day competing, debating, um, being stressing yourself out at Princeton, right? And then just not winning, getting completely shut out. You don't win anything. So investing upwards of like 150 hours into this conference and not winning anything. But then if that's your first conference experience and you just choose to give up right after that, um, then you sort of failed at overcoming hardship. Uh, however, students that have gone on to win, and myself included, my first conference was at Cornell, and Henry actually, I remember, like, drove me to Cornell, spent four days there, and I did not win. I lost. And I remember just coming back home, being super dejected, but then overcoming that hardship, and the next year, immediately winning at Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, right after, um, just taking what I've learned from that experience. U.S. schools very much value that, and they want you to tell your story of when you have overcome hardship. Mal UN, I think at like any competitive pursuit, whether it be like soccer or hockey or chess or anything that's competitive, definitely teaches students to build up mental character and deal with defeats and hardships and loss. All right, this is our last section. I think, yeah, I'll be done by 7.50. Just answering the question, is Molly one right for you or your student or your child? And I wanna talk about some key 
takeaways and as well as my personal anecdotes. And I'll start with my personal anecdotes, specifically how I think I grew in Malu, I grew in high school with Malu Yuan. So a very simple thing happened in high school, which was I started winning at conferences. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. Um, this is something I can put on my resume. But if that was it, I would just draw a box around winning conferences and say, this goes on my university application and this is just isolated. That's it. But I realized that winning at conferences actually allows me to develop transferable skills, or at least preparing myself to win at conferences allowed me to develop two key transferable skills. And the first one was strong research and debating skills. So I'm very confident now with um, like debating different ideas, debating political ideas, political issues, as well as researching um, foreign affairs, the opinions of different countries, what's going on right now, for example, in Russia or Argentina. And the second transferable skill I feel like I developed was confidence. Definitely lots of confidence to lead and then also the competence to challenge others when I think uh, there's a better way of doing things. So let's focus on that first transferable skill again, strong research and debating skills. What did that transferable skill allow me to do? And for context, I started winning Molly when conferences in grade 10. I started learning in grade nine. I was taught by our head coach, Nirpensi Bukamaran, as well as um, I learned from, from this student from Georgetown SFS, School of Foreign Studies, a strong State Department affiliated school outside Washington, D.C. So those strong research and debating skills allowed me first to secure an internship for a Toronto startup in grade 11. And I was using my research skills for market research for them as a business analyst, and then using debating skills or presentation skills to present it to my superiors. I also uh, study really hard to get fives of AP history and English. I actually wasn't interested in these courses at all before I did Model UN. After learning about politics and history and doing lots of writing, I decided to give a try on those and I ended up doing well. And those are now college credits I have when I'm at NYU. So if we go now to the second transferable skill that I felt like I learned, which was confidence, that grew into two key achievements I had. First was winning a grant from the government to pursue a nonprofit venture in grade 12, and then becoming president of a high school Mali One club and an organizer and secretary of a couple of conferences in the GTA region. Let's break this down again into those key components I mentioned earlier. We have here transferable skills, I feel like. I develop. And then here are, you know, bullet points for my university application. And this all started, of course, with coming to Linky, doing well at conferences. Um, I think a lot of the focus is usually put on like the, the dark circles, the university application points, like interning at a startup and winning a grant, becoming president of a club, five on APs. But well, I actually like to focus on the transferable skills I developed, which was confidence, competence, research, and debate. These will be with me uh, for the majority of the rest of my adult life. And I'll be able to you know, pursue many more ventures um, after high school, in university, after university, in the workplace, with these strong skills that I had the chance to learn with Model UN in high school. So Molly One is really about developing those skills in the center of your screen right now, those transferable, transferable skills. And the earlier that your student or you uh, develop these, just the wider your horizons will be, because you will be able to use your existing experiences and leverage them to have new ones. So I'd like to end off my presentation now with three simple criteria, I would say, that you can ask yourself or ask about your student if you think they're ready for Molly UN. Three simple criteria. The first one is, are they creative? Do they have creativity? And it's a very simple thing I think um, you can fulfill, which is ask yourself, have you ever written a story, performed a concert, painted a picture, acted in a play? A lot of Molly UN is about play acting. You have that creative spark within you. And 
No, you don't need to have been a debater before. It's just, have you been part of stories? Have you been part of fiction? Second is dedication. And again, you don't need to have been a dedicated debater or done public speaking. It's just, have you ever tried your best at something you were passionate about? Anything. And finally, empathy. Empathy. You care about the feelings of others. You want to lead others by example. You want to be a leader. You want to serve others, care for others, lead by example. Is that just something you want to do? But you should ask yourself. And I chose these three specifically because um, one of the first slides I presented to you today was the basics of Model UN. There were three basics of Model UN. So creativity, dedication, and empathy become, in Model UN, being an ambassador, debating about real life issues, and playing the game of leadership. Those three tenants I mentioned earlier are related to creativity, dedication, and empathy. And that's everything Model UN is about. The three basics of Model UN can be being an ambassador, real life debate, and leadership. But the three basics of Model UN can also be embodying empathy, dedication, and creativity. So instead of thinking, hold on, that sounds terrifying, that's a lot of pressure, think creativity, dedication, and empathy. And I hope this could be the start of something great. So thank you everyone for listening to this presentation. And at this point, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask them or Henry will take over for uh, the Chinese translation. All right. Thank you, Shane. Uh, can you maybe just close your uh, screen sharing and uh, uh, I'm gonna share mine. That might be easier. Good. OK， 呃，我用中文很快讲一下哈，然后，呃，大家应该能看到我的屏幕。如果大家现在有问题呢，呃，你就把问题写到我们的这个 chat 啊，写到这个对话窗里面，啊，这样的话就不会一会儿就忘记掉，好不好？啊，我我非常快，大概三三三五分钟吧。那，呃，今天我们主要讲的是这个模拟联合国 Model UN 的几个。呃，重要的内容啊，基本上有六个内容，啊，我们非常快的过一下啊，呃，这个 Shane 的介绍，刚才我们介绍过了，就不多说了，这是我也不说了。然后，什么是猫的语文？什么是模拟联合国啊？很多人问过我说，呃，有这么多人文语言类的这样的竞技比赛啊，比如说有 debate， 有模拟联合国，有 mock trial。有呃 ，public speaking， 有 DECA， 他们之间都是什么关系？他们之间都有什么样的区别啊？基本上是这样。当然，这个是我我们我自己总结的。所有刚才说的这些，都叫人文语言类的竞赛啊。那人文语言类的竞赛，他们基本上都是相同的一个，呃，我们叫叫结构了。那这个相同的地方在哪里呢？就是说，它都是两层结构。第一层呢是你的展现能力啊，如果是口头展现的话，就是 public speaking， 就是我们叫公众演讲了，因为是你靠你的口头把你的内容传递和表达出去，这是第一层，在上面那一层啊。当然，如果你是书面表达的话，就是写作啊，这个是呃，一个是口头，一个是书面。我们基本上竞赛活动里面以口头表达为主。那书面表达也有，在 d e c a 里面，就刚才呃 s h a n 提到了一个商业竞赛里面，它有一些书面的东西啊。其实 Model UN 也有书面的东西，刚才 s h a n 也讲讲到了啊，你要有一些写作要要要这个、呃、参与到里面去啊。当然还有写作竞赛，那个我们不是我们今天要讲的重点。所以这是第一层，就是你的表现层或者展现层，在第一层后面有一个更重要的一层，就是知识结构层啊，我们叫 Knowledge Base。那知识结构层的不同，就造成了刚才我们说的这些竞赛项目的不同啊
，比如说模拟联合国，现今天讲到了很多几个地方，那更更简单一点的说，就模拟联合国基本上它关心的是国际政治、国际关系、国际贸易这些相关的一些领域啊。比如说 DICA, 戴卡，戴卡它主要的它的内容、它的知识结构就是商务类。那 mock trial 模拟法庭，它的知识结构就是法律类，所以因为这个知识结构的不同，造成了这些不同的竞赛啊。当然还有很多其他的竞赛，比如说 HOSA，HOSA HOSA 是呃医学类，但是他们也有相同的地方，就是他们前面的这个 presentation layer 啊，我们或者我们叫展现层，基本上是相同的。所以那我们就知道模拟联合国，它主要是刚才我们说到的。国际政治啊，国际关系啊，国际贸易啊，啊，那所以这个地方先讲了三个主要的内容，一个是怎么样防止未来的这种世界性的战争再一次爆发，第二个怎么样能够呃终结一些呃人道的一些呃危机啊、呃，比如说一些这种饥饿的危机啊等等啊，包括我们现在的这个呃。COVID 就是我们这个新冠病毒的呃这样的一个流行病的危机啊、呃、然后怎么样提高呃科学研究包括一些这个文化方面领域里面的、呃、模拟联合国最重要的几个基础，非常快我们说一下啊，第一就是你是一个呃大使 ambassador 啊、呃，就是模拟联合国你参加这个比赛，你不是你个人，你是代表一个国家啊。第二，它是有有。一个 debate 的内容在里面的，很多人在这地方有一点，有一点这个被混淆掉、混淆掉，说，呃，模拟联合国有 debate， 然后没有有真正的 debate 的比赛啊，啊，这个模拟联合国里面我们说的 debate 的是一种，实际上是一个过程了，就是我的观点，我代表我的国家，我们提出来的方案，可能另外一个国家他不同意，那我们就需要在委员会当中大家来去辩论和讨论这个问题。那另外那个 debate 比赛，那是另外一种刚才我们说的人文语言类的一个竞赛项目啊。明天我们有一个讲座，呃，由加拿大国家队的教练 Brent 啊、呃，也是我们的 debate 的主教练啊，专门给我们讲 debate， 就是那个是 debate 的那个竞赛活，那个竞赛的内容竞呃竞赛项目啊，跟这个里面这个里面我们说的 debate， 它实际上只是一个过程。啊，只是一个，只是一个技呃技能啊啊，那个是一个单独的一个完整的一个项目，呃、啊，我们那个明天明天晚上七点啊,啊，然后呃、啊、，game of leadership 就是你的领导力了，因为你在模拟联合国当中，你要展现你的领导力，因为你要团结很多人，你要团结很多你的朋友啊，让这些人能够帮助你，能够给你一些支持。这样的话，你的方案才有可能被通过。然后，模拟联合国它的比赛当中，它是有很多不同的委员会。这个我们其实我们知道，模拟联合国在日常的，我们想象一下，真正的联合国啊、呃、是什么样子？那模拟联合国就是一模一样啊、呃。那么真正联合国它有很多委员会，比如说它有环境委员会，它有这种呃。呃，文化委员会，它也有医疗卫生委员会等等啊，所以呃，在模拟联模拟联合国比赛当中啊，所有的比赛都是在委员会内进行的啊。那么委员会是怎么是怎么样的一个过程？这个地方是呃，我们说的这个委员会的一个过程。所以第一就是首先要有一个问题，就是我们要解决什么问题？比如说我们要解决目前世界饥饿问题啊，那。这个地方呢，我们举的一个例子就是目前俄罗斯跟乌克兰之间的一个非常严重的，目前看来一个有可能是有要形成状战争的这样的一个危机了。那这个问题是我们这个地方用来呃来拿它来做一个例子，我们来想讲一下这个模拟联合国呃委员会当中是怎样的一个过程啊。假设我们这个问题就是苏联要侵略乌克兰。那当然，我们作为一个联合国的委员会，我们是希望能够防止这样的事情发生。第二，呃 ，delegate assemble 就是我们要组成这样的一个各个国家参与的各个国家大使参与的这样的一个这样的一个委员会。啊，第一步我们是确认
，我们要解决什么问题？第二步，我们要把这些国家组织起来啊，大概是三十个或者到四十个。第三，你要做大量的这种调研工作，比如说俄罗斯的背景是什么，乌克兰的背景是什么，他们两个都是原来的前苏联的加盟共和国，他们之间有什么地缘上的关系？有什么样的这种冲突，有什么样的这种利益等等等等啊！你要做很多很多调研。那第四一步就是我们真真正比赛开始的时候，要在这个委员会当中进行辩论，就是我的观点，我代表加拿大啊，你可能代表日本，另外一个人可能代表代表中国，另再有一个人代表俄罗斯等等。我们要去辩论，要解找到一个解决方案啊。第五就是呃，我们需要。国家能够支持我，啊，如果我的方案希望能够被委员会通过的话，你肯定靠你自己一票是不够的，你是需要，啊，多数的国家能够支持你啊。第六就是最后，如果这个方案被通过的话，它就形成了一个联合国的一个规则，啊，或者说一个一个啊，我们叫 UN law， 就是联合国的一个法律。毛对 UN 在 l i n k e 的。呃，整个的我们的课程的结构的设置，我们有四个 level 啊 ，level one、level two、level three、level four 啊，具体我就不说了，因为大概大家理解一下，就是 level one 就是我们的入门级别啊，我们可能就会讲一些呃一些规则，国家之间的呃每个国家之间的一些特点啊，怎么样去写你的写你的这个 speech， 就是你的口头的这种表达 presentation。啊、uh, ，Level Two 的时候，我们更多的就会讲国际关系的一些原理啊，怎么样去形成，去把你的 resolution， 就是你的呃、啊、方案把它写出来。啊 ，Model Three， 呃、uh, ，Sorry，Level Three， 我们更多的会去讲怎么能够去形成一个啊更更呃高级别的一些解决方案啊。那到 Level Four 的时候，就我们更多的是呃。啊重点集中在怎么去赢得比赛，啊，因为赢得比赛是我们的目的。我们的学生来到 Link， 我们是为了帮助他们去赢得比赛。啊，这个里面就是他，呃，甚至举了一个例子，在我们的 Level Two 当中，我就不具体说了哈，就当当时的这个，呃，阿富汗的危机。啊，经历了美国的私人总统等等啊，这个过程，这是我们的一个上课的内容啊，我就啊很快的把它过去。然后呢，这个是 Shane 当时他自己写的一个关于呃在呃北极开发石油的一个提案啊，因为开发石油在呃这种北北极的时候，它会影响到一些环境问题啊，我们也不多说了。然后，呃，这个是关于委员会的一些具体的内容，这个我们就很快把它过去啊。然后，呃，我们怎么能够帮助学生能够赢得这些比赛啊？呃，比赛基本上有三大类啊，一个呢就是我们地区型比赛，主要是由一些呃高中来举办。那国家级的比赛呢，由一些大学举办，比如说，呃，这个多大每年有一个很大的一个模拟联合国的。呃，比赛啊 ，McGill 也有一个非常大的比赛叫 Science 啊，所以这个都是国家级的比赛。那国际级的比赛就更多的是由像美国的这个常春藤学校来举办，比如说哈佛大学的毛的 UN 啊，斯坦福的毛毛的 UN，MIT 的毛的 UN 等等。这个是我们的呃整个的教学。过程当中，我们使用的一些呃具体的一些教学的方法啊、呃、我们的整个的教教学和教研的 team 啊，非常的都是过去本身我们这些老师，我们这些教练，他们都是呃在各个呃 model 语文领域里面取得过非常非常突出的成绩的这些这些呃老师和教练，好啊、呃，然后。我们在我们的教学当中，我们叫 hybrid，hybrid hybrid 就是一个一个组合了。组合一其中的一部分是我们的所有的内容的，呃 ，lecture 就是所谓的内容的知识传递。那还有一部分就是刚才我们反复在说的，就是比赛的准备。啊，就像我们可以把它想象成一个体育比赛。啊，我们要讲在体育比赛当中，我们要
比如说篮球啊，我平常在练习当中，你要练习很多很多基本知呃技能，比如说带球，比如说投篮等等啊。同时，我们要讲很多这种比赛当中的一些啊一些技巧和和经验。然后 ，conference coaching methodology， 我们怎么去帮助学生做这个啊比赛的准备啊？一般我们有一这个提前大概提前一个月就要开始啊，比赛之前就大概提前一个月。啊，这个是由我们的老师就要开始整个的这个 conference preparation， 就是我们所谓的比赛准备啊。然后我们会有助教，我们的助教会帮助呃参赛的学生来做刚才我们说的这些，你的 resolution， 你的包括你的写作部分啊。呃，第三就是我们的 strategy。就是你到底在比赛当中，你去采取什么样的策略，你才有可能赢？这个有很多很多具体内容，今天我没有办法时间的关系把它展开讲啊。那第四就是我们比赛之后，会有我们的教练、呃、学生，包括家长，我们会有一个这种赛后的总结，就是把我们的整个的比赛过程当中的收获，包括我们的经验，包括我们的一些呃教训，哪些地方做得好，哪些地方需要改善等等。我们会有一个这种赛后的总结。还有稻草，这三个我比较喜欢。呃，麻烦您关一下话筒好吗？谢谢。好。现在这地方讲他，他还呃，我觉得盛言比较谦虚了。他说我们是 Ontario Top Private M U N Education Education Institute。呃，我们可能是安省呃最。从成绩上来讲是最好的，呃 ，Model UN 的这样的一个培训，呃，培训俱乐部啊，培训机构，呃，一会儿我们可以看我们的一些，呃，具体的成绩，就这个我们列了一些哈、啊，呃，过往的取得的一些成绩，比如说，呃 ，McGill Model UN 二零二一年，我们有三个第一名，三个第一名，呃，大家说为什么有三个第一名？第一名不只有一个吗？因为有不同的委员会啊，刚才我们讲了就是。环境委员会，然后医疗卫生委员会等等啊，啊，不同的委员会里面都是有一个冠军，有一个亚军，亚军有一个第三名啊，所以我们有三个学生拿到了三个委员会的冠军，啊 ，Harvard 就是哈佛大学的 MUN， 哈佛杜拜的 MUN， 二零二一年也是去年啊，我们有一个冠军，一个第二名，两个第三名，呃、啊、，sorry， 一个第二名，两个第三名，这样，啊，普林斯顿 MUN， 二零二一年。我们是赢得了，呃，集体第二名，啊，集体第二名，啊 ，Level Four Student One Outstanding Small Delegation， 然后 Second Place Team Award， 啊 ，MIT MUN 我们有两个第一名，啊，两个 Best Delegate。MUN 的呃奖就是这个，呃，它这个名次的叫法跟其他地方不一样，其他地方一般就叫 Champion， 啊，或者叫 First Second， 啊 ，Model UN 叫。Best delegate, best delegate 就是就是冠军的意思，啊 ，outstanding delegate 是亚军的意思，啊 ，honorable mention 是第三名，铜牌的意思，啊，这个呃、嗯、，MUN 的叫法跟别的别的比赛不太一样，大家知道就可以了。然后，对美国大学和加拿大大学申请的影响，我稍微呃多说一点点这个地方啊，就是。其实影响是巨大，因为我们帮助很多学生做这种大学的申请，给大家一些建议，包括美国、包括加拿大等等啊。呃，最最重要的一点就是，整个的大学的申请，尤其是这些，呃，全世界最著名的、最知名的这些大学，然后最知名的这些专业，变得越来越难，就是申请的难度变得越来越大。原因是什么？呃，非常简单，申请的人越来越多，呃，那么分母在增加，分子没有变化，那肯显然的就是你难度就越来越大啊。呃，这个地方我们提到了几点，第一个叫 grade inflation， 什么叫 grade inflation？ 啊 ，grade inflation 就是一个我们叫学习成绩、学习分数通货膨胀啊，就是原来可能是大家得一个九十分，就就已经是很好的分数了。现在可能都要九十五，甚至九十六，甚至九十八啊，呃，那么高中打分数的时候呢，也变得标准越来越松
啊，所以很多大学呢，它是有一个系数出来，就他们知道有一些高中打分数打的比较松，那你打的九十五分，我可能会给你一个系数啊，所谓的系数就是给你一个折扣了，比如说乘一个零点九，那你九十五分，也许呃，这个大家可以做做个拿计算器摁一下，比如说九十五分变成九十分钟，假如说是这样啊，他针对一些高中会给你一个这个这个系数了，那。另外一个就是刚才我们说的，除了你的在校成绩之外，啊，造成这个的呃原因是因为我们我们加拿大我们安省没有一个标准化考试，啊，这个大家都知道，美国有标准标准化考试叫 SAT， 中国有标准化考试叫高考，但是在我们加拿大在安省没有标准化考试，所以很多分数出现这种叫等分不等值，啊，比如 A 学校的95分跟 B 学校的95分，可能它的含金量是不一样。这就为什么很多大学它会加一些系数在里啊、呃、那第二 ，extracurricular 就是课外部分的重要性变得越来越高啊。这个什么原因也很简单，就是因为大家现在分数都很好，你九十五，我也九十五，有很多很多人都是九十五，那我怎么在这些这么好的分数的学生当中做选择？大学招生办他已经没有什么太好的办法了，如果只看分数的话，所以他要通过其他的方面来去帮助他去挑选他想要的学生。那最重要的就是 extracurricular 啊，就是课外活动部分。其实这些呢，美国早就开始实行了。一会儿我们会讲到讲到一个呃一个一个幻灯片的时候，会讲到美国那个申请部分。那加拿大原来主要是以分数为主，但是加拿大现在开始把。刚才我们说的课外活动部分，你的获奖部分，这个比例在在增加，而且它是一个现在进行时，就是每年都会我们能看到它的变化，它慢慢的会向美国的一些大学申请的这个标准再去靠啊。那什么意思？就是向那边靠的意思就是刚才我们说的，一个是你的 extra curricular， 就是课外活动部分啊，所谓的教室以外你在做什么，这个比重在增加。你的获奖所占的比重在增加啊，呃，这个是一个很快的一个呃一个饼图啊啊，大概就是美国大学用到的，现在加拿大学、加拿大大学也在用啊，大概百分之四十是在你的课外成绩方面，百分之三十是在你的课外活动啊 ，extra curricular 方面，然后另外百分之三十是你最后的申请的文书。和其他的一些方面，比如说老师推荐信啊，比如说呃，比如说这个 interview 啊，就是面试等等啊。所以大家可以看到，就是说你的课内成绩部分只占了百分之四十，另外的百分之六十基本跟不是你的课外成绩，是你的课外活动，是你的呃文书写作，是你的 interview， 是你的老师给你的推荐信等等啊。然后。毛德渊适不适合你？这个是我们很快的一个一个路线图哈、啊，给大家简单的呃看一下，就是你怎么能赢嘛？你怎么能够获得刚才我们说的这个呃第一名、第二名或者第三名？因为这些奖项对你非常非常的呃有帮助啊、呃。首先你要有一个很强的这种我们叫调研的呃 research 和 debating skills。你的调研和你的辩论能力，你的表达能力，你的能够把你的思路、你的思维整理好，然后把它传递出去，同时能够说服别人。那这些，如果你能够呃具备刚才我们说的这些能力的话，其实它不仅仅是帮助你赢得像毛队 UN 这样的比赛，更重要，它会影响你，会帮助你在后面今后你的大学学习、大学之后的工作。以至于你人人生后面的很长很长的路，他都会能够帮到你啊。呃，先讲到这个地方的时候，他讲到了他自己的一些经验，就是说，呃，他因为参与像猫的语文这样的这样的这种训练和比赛啊、呃，那这些技能、这些这些他的这些经验，帮助他可以在多伦多找到一个呃，十一年级的时候找到一个实习机会，同时帮助他的 AP 考试。所以这些我们看到，它其实都是相辅相成，啊啊！同时在你的 conference 当中，我们刚才讲到的领导力啊
啊，帮助 Shane 拿到了一个三千五百块的一个政府的一个呃 government 呃 grant， 基本上就是一个奖学金啊啊，同时他拿到了他们自己学校的毛利人俱乐部的主席这样的一个很好能够展现他领导力的这样的一个机会啊啊，那大家有没有准备好来参加毛利人这个活动？其实呃 ，Shane 列了三点啊，就是第一你的创造力，第二就是你的 dedication。啊，就是你有没有这种热情，你愿不愿意投入你的精力来做这件事情？第三就是你的同理心了，就你有没有关心别人啊？因为领导力、同理心是领导力当中这个非常重要的一部分啊。你有没有站在对方角度考虑问题？你有没有站在很多其他人的角度去多元化的考虑问题啊？这个是领导力的一个很重要、很重要的。那最后一，我最后说一句啊，就是，呃，这个是这个是 Shane 的呃最后的一个联，我们的一些联系方式啊，包括 Shane 的 email， 包括电话等等啊，包括包括 Linky 的网站、呃，最后说一句话，就是模拟联合国它最重要的一点，我个人认为啊，区别于所有其他活动，它最重要的一点是它要去找到解决问题的方案，呃，那在大学招生。招生了老师的眼里，那这样的学生一定是他们喜欢的，就是碰到问题，他们知道怎么去分析问题，怎怎么去拆解问题，然后最重要的是能够找到方案啊，能够去解决问题，这个是非常非常非常重要的，不仅仅是大学申请，当然大学申请是我们现在所有学生当中，我说是中学生、高中生一个非常重要的一个里程碑的任务。milestone 啊，但是孩子在今后走向工作岗位，今后他的这个人生的后面很长很长的路当中，这个能力都会帮助他啊。所以我们刚才讲就是叫 problem solving 啊，能够解决问题的能力啊。然后最后呃，我我马上这个来回答大家的问题哈、啊。最后给大家几个呃小的通知啊，就是一个就是我明天晚上有一个呃 debate 关于 debate。就学术辩论的一个呃，学术辩论比赛的一个讲座啊，讲座是由呃，当目前加拿大国家队的教练 Brian Schmidt 啊，还有我们另外几个教练啊，我们明天大概有呃四个教练啊，来跟大家讲呃 debate 方面的一些课程设置啊，包括我们的包括我们的这个比赛比赛的一些技巧和策略等等啊，包括国家队怎么去申请加拿大国家队啊，大家知道加拿大国家队底背的国家队如果能够进去的话，呃，基本上你的大学的这种呃加分会非常非常的有效，就是你对大学申请啊，像美国常春藤这样的学校啊，所以明天晚上七点啊啊，如果大家有兴趣的话，可以联系小助手，好吗？啊，然后我们回到。我们的 Q&A， 我们的问题。All right, great presentation. Uh, thank you, Shane. I wonder if I will be granted an access to the recorded presentation. Uh, yeah. We, we, so you can you can contact um、uh, contact us, right? Uh, we we can share the video with you. 那有一个中文的问题哈，呃，请问某种程度上是否可以说模拟联合国比辩论相对更容易出成绩？呃，很，我我我们很难讲哪个比哪个更容易出成绩啊。呃，我觉得只要孩子喜欢，因为每一个孩子他可能他的兴趣点都不太一样，他的热情可能也都不太一样。啊，有的有的学生真的就是喜欢模拟联合国，非常非常喜欢。有的学生喜欢底背，有人喜欢，有的学生喜欢呃模拟法庭，啊、呃，有的喜欢，有的学生喜欢商务竞赛，像 DECA 或者像呃沃顿商学院的这个投资竞赛啊、呃。我觉得孩子做他自己喜欢的事情，然后呢，他投入，他就容易出成绩。呃，假设我们说有一个比赛很容易出成绩，但那个那个。孩子不喜欢，我觉得我们不会不会建议他去做啊，就是一定做他自己喜欢的，因为只有做他自己喜欢的
他才才能够事事半功倍。另外，多说一句了，在大学申请当中，美国大学申请当中，这个指标呢是斯坦福大学最早提出来的啊，叫 intellectual vitality。那这个指标是考核什么？就是考核你学生，你这个学生做这件事情，做这个课外活动，做这个竞技活动，比如说模拟联合国，他为什么要做这件事情？他有一个指标专门。考察考核你做这件事情的动机啊，这个是斯坦福大学提出来的。现在一些长春长春藤大学也也在用，当然只不过他们没有把它纳入到他们的这个录取打分当中。斯坦福是有是有录这个纳入到他的录取打分当中。所以你的动机是什么？是你就为了我想去学它，然后因为爸爸妈妈让我学，因为我的好朋友让我学，因为我想要呃。取得什么样的一个成绩，我学，还是因为你真的是喜欢他，还是因为你真的是觉得通过这个比赛，通过这个这个比赛的这种训练，能够帮助你提高很多你自己在相应的一些领域当中的能力，到底是哪一种？大学他们是想要找后者啊，刚才我们提到的这个啊、呃，这个叫 intellectual vitality。OK。现在这个地方好像有回啊。Shane, I think you, uh, which, which, which question you were trying to, uh, you were trying to answer Sam's question, I think. Oh, I see. Uh, Sam's question. Uh, can you repeat the question? I, I don't, I don't see the question for some reason. Oh, it was just about what level you can start participating in Model UN. Oh, the I conferences see. in conferences. Okay. All right. 呃，我我说到一个 ，Do you see Kathy's question? Which grade is proper to start to study Model UN? I would say, 嗯、um, uh, ，probably middle middle school. Oh, yeah, oh, but some well, places don't have middle school. Shane, we're not there yet. Uh, there's some some earlier questions. Oh, I don't see those actually. You can go ahead. Yeah. Uh, because some questions are sent to me. Uh, oh, I see. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, they didn't send to the group. Uh, but anyways, uh, 就有一个用中文发的问题哈、啊，是直接发发到我我发到我这边来的。他说，呃、uh, ，Model UN 与学生未来所学的专业有关吗？对哪些专业有帮助？呃、uh, ，我可以理解这类奖项对文科类学生在 admission 方面有帮助，对未来学理工和医科的学生这类奖这类。呃，成绩奖项对申请学校有帮助吗 ？I think yes， 我觉得有啊。那我先把这个问题交给 Shane， 然后我我一会儿我再补充两句啊。Shane， 呃、uh, ，the question is， let me let me try to try translate the question. Okay,、uh, uh, I I understand it. You do,、um, you do. Okay,、yeah, go ahead. The question is about whether or not if you're studying engineering or STEM or medicine, if、yeah. Model UN will help you. I think、mm -hmm. absolutely. Because I mentioned earlier in one of my slides, and Henry, if you want to move to it now, that in Canada, top engineering programs, especially engineering, computer science, and medicine programs, are requiring more and more、um, extracurricular involvement, and they, I think, want to see a well-developed person. That means if you want to study medicine,、uh, definitely high grades in biology, chemistry, interest,、uh, perhaps volunteering at a hospital. But also being able to do out things outside of medicine, for example, doing model UN and demonstrating that you can communicate effectively and that you can research effectively, and even for engineering,、um, a huge part of the University of Toronto's engineering application、uh, asks you to list your extracurricular involvement. And、uh, I have a friend that did debate who's currently at the University of Toronto studying engineering science. Who you know credits a lot of his admission to doing well in debate and actually making him stand out compared to the sea of applicants who didn't really do that much debate and focused more on、uh, traditional STEM-focused extracurriculars. I think if your、uh, son or daughter is interested in STEM or medicine, that's great, and ask them to pursue extracurriculars in that field. Also, maybe have. Um, like like a communications activity, a communications competition that they can also pursue because the ability to communicate well is valued in any field, and also allows you to distinguish yourself strategically during the application process. Yeah, 
呃，我我用我用中文讲啊，因为你是用中文问的啊。那个，我帮 Shane 稍微再再补充两句，因为他刚才用英文讲的时候，我就讲的已经非常清楚，就是说，呃，大家有一个误区了，就觉得好像猫的 UN 或者 Debate 或者呃猫创啊这些这些活动这些比赛只是给呃人文历史类的，我们叫文科类的呃专业会有帮助，其实完完全全不是这个样子。啊，大学招生办他想要看到，并不是说你将来学理工你就一定要做理工类，他更多的是想看到刚才 Shane 讲到的你的 communication skills， 就是你的沟通能力啊，他更想看到的是你的 dedication， 就是我做一件事情，我是不是真正的去投入它，然后我把这件事情做好，当然你怎么样怎么样做好，就通过你的一些成绩来展现，对不对？所以，他更多的是想要看到你在这些方面所展现出来的，你愿意去挑战自己，愿意挑去挑战一些呃，不管是比赛还是什么样的一些新鲜事物啊，你愿意去推动自己，然后去激励自己，把自己变得更好啊。那我们所谓的所谓的更好，其中很重要的一个部分就是 communication 啊，这就是为什么很多学生或者家长来问我们说。呃，我大学申请当中哪一项技能可能最重要？呃，我可能会认为是 communication， 因为不管你将来做任何专业，如果你没有一个很好的这种这种沟通能力啊，你很难把你自己的想法跟别人家讲清楚啊，你也很难去让别人去认同你的想法，你也很难去聚集到其他的资源，因为不管你做任何事情，理工类什么。文文科类，不管你做任何事情，你一个人是很难成功的。你一定要聚集资源，当然，聚集资源包括人，包括其他的资源，对不对？你要去聚聚集这些人，跟你一起来把这件事情完成，把这件事情做好。那你能够聚集这些资源，需要你的 communication。这就是为什么大家现在看现在这个图啊，这个饼状图里面，它有 30% 是。在你的文书写作，在你的最后的这个面试当中，所以 communication 的这种重要性，跟你将来的专业没有没有绝对的关系。好，呃、uh, ，There's a question from Sam 啊，也是用中文哈、啊，请问什么 level 可以参加比赛？一个 level 多长时间？啊、um, ，I think Shane, you answer this question, right? Anyone can participate. Um, I'll be giving the students. You will be recommending the reading. Okay, yeah. Um, 对，因为每一个 Model UN 是每一个 level 的学生都可以参加比赛。啊，呃，当然，不同 level 的学生，不同级别的学生参加比赛的侧重点可能会不一样。啊，比如说稍微经验少一点的学生，啊，他可能会参加一些这种 regional 的比赛，对他来说帮助可能更大。因为那个比赛相对来讲人数少一点，然后竞争稍微没有那么激烈，对学生的这种通过比赛啊，以以赛代练的这个过程的帮助会更大一些。但是每一个 level 都可以参加比赛，这个没有问题。呃、uh, ，Cathy 问，哦、oh, ，This is the question that Shane just mentioned. For which grade is proper to start? 呃、uh, ，for for to study more than you. 我们建议不呃六年级了，我们建议大概六年级差不多可以开始，呃，当然如果这个学学生他有一些基础，刚才我们讲的就是我们的展现那个展现层，比如说 public speaking 的基础的话，他有可能稍微早一点啊、呃。有的学生如果稍微这方面基础稍微呃不是很多的话，那可能稍微晚一点啊。有一些个体差异了，但基本上来讲，我们给大家的建议是 Grade Six。OK， 呃。Vivi 给我个人的一个 message 说 ，Debate 上到哪个 level 可以学 Model UN？ 如何 Debate 学完 Level Three？ 呃 ，Model UN 还要从 Level One 开始吗？是的，呃 ，Debate 上到哪个 level 可以学 Model UN？ UN 这两个之间没有 dependency， 这两个之间没有依赖关系，不是说你要学完 Debate 再上 Model UN， 或者要学完 Model UN 再上 Debate， 没有，这两个可以完全独立。啊，就 debate 你没学过，你也可以学 model 学 model 学没学过，你也可以学 debate 
，你也可以两个同时学。实际上，我们是确实有很多学生两个同时学，因为他们互相之间是是有是有帮助。啊，呃，那我底辈子学完 Level Three， 要不要猫的语文从 Level One 开始？可能还是需要，因为我们 Level Level One 刚才 Shane 有一个有一个呃这个幻灯片，就是 Level One 讲很多。基础内容，比如说比赛的过程、比赛的 research 等等这些，呃，如果你没上的这些基础内容，在底背当中是不会讲的。那在 Model UN Level Two 当中也不会讲啊。所以如果你不上的话，你整个这一部分内容是就缺失掉了啊。OK， 呃、uh, ，Sam said， 哦、oh, ，Thank you， s h a n t h i n k o h n o problem。呃，有一个问题哈，关于模拟联合国辩论公共演讲，怎么能让孩子聚焦？也就是说，让孩子怎样才能发现哪个是他们最擅长和喜欢的？呃，是要每一个都试一遍吗？有没有更有效的方法？呃，很多家长跟学生都问过我类似这样的问题啊。呃，我我我我举一个比喻啦，不一定特别特别的恰当，但是大概。我希望大家能够理解我的意思吧。比如说，呃，我们问孩子你喜欢吃什么东西，呃，可能最好的办法就是让他去尝试。呃，我经常跟大家举举例子，我说你应该带他去那个夜市啊，因为夜市里面那个食品种类非常多，啊，有面，有炒饭，有什么，呃，肉等等各种各样的东西，啊，你让他去尝嘛，他尝一口，他才知道他喜欢还是不喜欢。那你去问他，你说。呃，你喜不欢吃面，或者你喜不喜欢吃什么牛排等等，他很难去想象，你也很难去判断说，哦，这个孩子性格有可能喜欢吃炸酱面，那个孩子性格有可能喜欢吃，呃，什么什么什么羊肉串，你很难去做这种猜测。所以，我们基本上给大家的建议也是要多做一些尝试，就是你在中学阶段。在高中阶段，你尽量可能的情况下，让孩子多做一些事情，多做一些事情，其实会为他们打开很多很多窗口，会为他们赢得很多很多机会啊。呃，你不去做这样的这种尝试，很多时候你可能就错失掉了很多，其实是他可能会很感兴趣的事情。呃，再再多啰嗦一个。我我们我们经历过很多学生，呃，比如说 debate， 因为 debate 我们开开展的时间比较早，像 debate 我们当时就是有一些学生刚来的时候是完全不适应，站在台前会会会掉眼泪那种的啊，呃，性格上家长认为这个我们这个孩子太内向，不适合做这件事情，但是所幸的是他本人包括家长坚持下来，那这些这这几个学生。最后都取得了非常好的成绩啊，然后有几个进入到加拿大国家队，所以就是你只是看他的性格，或者说我们家长的一些判断，其实可能是不是真正孩子想要的啊，所以呃，回答您的这个问题啊，我我觉得还是要让大家多做尝试啊，多做尝试，多做尝试对孩子来说一定是一个是一个过程。OK， 呃、uh, ，Any other questions? You can always leave them in the chat, or you can just yeah, unmute your microphone, ask it out loud. Yep, yeah. I think you can turn on your microphone and ask your questions. Okay, any more questions? Um, I mean, you can type them in the chat, or maybe just, you know. Turn on microphone and ask. 大家还有没有问题啊？你们可以写在里面，或者直接把把话筒打开啊。啊，我们的时间看一下哦，我们时间也差不多。好，那呃，如果大家没有其他问题，我们今天就到这里啊。呃，这个地方有一个最后的联系方法，包括 Shane 的联系方法。我们 Linky 的联系方法啊，大家后面如果还有问题可以跟我们联系，包括呃、uh, ，if you want to，if you guys want the slides 啊、uh, ，if you want the video recording 
uh, just contact us, right? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to send them to you. Uh, oh, 还有一个问题，呃，关于搭档参加模拟联合国的比赛，是届时匹配水平相当的吗？模拟联合国没有搭档，呃。这个不像 debate，debate debate 是你是有一个 partner 的，呃，模拟联合国没有 partner， 啊，我们都是这个学生自己个人，就是一个人就是一个国家，啊，你在这个委员会当中，你代表中国就代表中国，你就是中国的这个联合国特派大使，你代表加拿大你就加拿大的联合国特派大使，啊，没，呃，模拟联合国没有搭档，嗯，啊、uh, ，one exception to that though， sometimes two students two delegates。Can represent the same country. We had that at Princeton this year, but it's relatively rare.、Um, if you have like a partner that you really want to work, with, two people can represent one country, and usually one person focuses on writing or resolutions of laws, and one person focuses on networking and speaking to other delegates. That's a possibility that sometimes occurs.、Um, I would say there's a. a Maybe two or three conferences a year that have that setup. Yep. Okay. 好，呃，呀，我我 ，you know, wrap up everything. Uh, just for now. Uh, if you guys have any、uh, questions, just feel free to reach out. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shane. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. It was an amazing translation. Oh, thank you. Did you prepare that, or was that all impromptu? That was amazing. No, it's all impromptu. Wow. <laughs> I'm trained for doing this. <laughs> trained exactly. Very well done. Thank you, Shane. Yeah. Have a good night. You too, Henry. Thank you so much. We'll be talking more. Yeah.、Thanks. All right. Bye. Goodbye, Henry. Thank you so much, and everyone else. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, guys. Good night. Good night, everyone.